Okay, Barbara, we're live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Another exciting evening at the Poison Pen. I'm telling you, if you're an 80-year-old female bookseller, this is the best thing ever because you get to hang out with all these gorgeous men. I mean, you know, in an otherwise boring life at the moment, this is a thrill. It's a double thrill tonight because we have Don Bentley with his second book featuring Matt Drake. And we have Jack Carr, who's going to be our host. And we're also going to do a little preview of the next James Reese, James Reese, the fourth James Reese thriller, which we will be launching at the Poison Pen on April the 12th. So very exciting. So guys, a glass to both of you. Congratulations to you both. Glass as well. Yay. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Well, we Love are you. Here. And, you know, John, I mean, Jack, we, we've had other events with you where we've talked about your credentials for writing the kind of books you do, you know, former Navy SEAL all around. I say to people, he's the kind of guy that could kill you with one finger, but usually he's well. <laughs> usually, <laughs> but not all the usually, time. Usually, but there's okay. always that moment when you think, don't really want to push Jack. But Don Bentley has a really impressive summary um, and Jack, why don't you walk him through it? Because it'll mean more to, you know, I think if it comes from you. I sure will. And it really stood out in this book. And I'll get to, I'll get to that here in a, in a little bit. But, uh, but Don was a, a, a pilot, a helicopter mm -hmm. pilot, an Apache pilot. So uh, for those who don't know what that is, definitely Google it right now or pull it up on your phone <laughs> to look. It's a, it's a, a menacing looking helicopter, a great platform. Uh, I was in <clears throat> respect for people that can climb into the, the cockpit of the helicopter and and uh, and zoom into harm's way. So, um, so did that. I think it was ten years. Is that right, Don? Yeah, ten years. That's right. Yeah, doing that, and then you transition to something uh, a, a lot uh, uh, a lot safer as an FBI agent, <laughs> not just an FBI agent, but uh, on a SWAT. Uh, that's right. Well. That's right. Yes. Yes. Taking the safe route. Absolutely. That's right. So you've got you. Yeah, you have some, some background in all the things that you write about, mm -hmm. in particular in this book. Um, and I'll get to some of that helicopter action here in a second, but um, <laughs> why don't we just uh, just kick it off? Does that sound good, Barbara? Sure. It sounds great. Let me just add one thing that I just discovered that Don is the holder of a bronze star. So mm. he was yeah. really uh, in action. <laughs> and he also joined a SWAT team, if I remember right. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's not going to screw up the guns part. <laughs> oh no, you're all good. I, you're good. I, read the, I went through it with a you know a fine tooth comb. Looking for something. It passed the know. jack test. That's it. That's Ooh. it. But uh, I'm gonna jump right in here because uh, yeah. I'm so because we're you know we kind of started similar times, have similar mm -hmm. backgrounds, that sort of thing. But uh, when you wrote your first novel, when you wrote without sanction, yep. uh, did you already yep. have in mind where you were going? next because people that are watching they might not know that typically it, with fiction you have to write it first you're not selling an idea you're not selling a chapter you're not selling an that's outline right. something that's like right. that you have a finished manuscript that then is going out there so people can read it in full um so as you wrote that did you already know this was going to be a series and did you know where it was going for this second book well of course i did jack i understood exactly where it was going and had it all planned now the so the truth of it is um everybody's writing journey is is a little bit different and i actually wrote three books before without sanction that didn't sell and so matt kind of showed up in the third book a little bit and and then in the fourth book as i'm writing without sanction you know i i structured that book around my protagonist matt drake and as I was writing it, you know, in the back of my mind, I, I wanted to believe that this was going to be the one that was published. But after three that didn't sell, you know, I, I was preparing myself for, for it not to be too. And so when Tom Colgan was nice enough to buy it and he bought it in a two book deal, then I thought, huh, I guess I got to figure out where this goes next. And so fortunately, um, like with most series writers like I knew I wanted to write a series of books around this protagonist because in our genre most if not all of the folks I think that they do write a series and so it was easier for me once I had Matt as a protagonist and kind of wrote the first book to see where the second would come but for me for the second one and, and I'm, I'm interested to hear how you do this too Jack but for me I got to have an idea that kind of grips me that drives it and I remember you talking about that idea and your fantastic one the savage son which is brilliant and and you know your third book and you just knock it out of the park which is amazing but what i did you know with um the outside man is i do have a, a background that that's kind of interesting but what i tell people is i i um just got to 
be in the room with some really cool people a lot of the times. And so I had, I had a person ask me once, you know, are you Matt Drake? And I said, I am absolutely not Matt Drake, but I have stood in the same room with him before. And so one of the folks that I stood in the same room with did kind of similar work to what Matt Drake does, you know, who, and Matt works overseas as a case officer, which is somebody who runs and recruits what we call, or what they call assets in the intelligence community and what we called sources in the FBI. And so the person was telling me kind of what that was like. And a lot of times those folks operate under legends or, or you know, not true names precisely to separate themselves and their families from the danger that happens over there. So that's that, that clear delineation. And as we were talking, he, he described for me what it was like to come home. And I guess much like, you know, when, when you and I went on deployments, but you come home and you have that almost visceral reaction to, I'm now safe. I'm, I'm going back to the part of my life that is, I purposely keep separated from anything else operational that I do, and that's going to be fine. And so as he said that, it kind of pinged with me, and I thought, man, what would it be like if, if it wasn't safe? If what you did while you were operational somehow followed you back home and then put everything that you value, that you deliberately shield from that part of your life at risk? And so that was kind of the genesis of the outside man. And then I kind of took that a step further and said, well, what are all the things that would have to go wrong for that to happen? And that's how it kind of came together. And so I certainly knew that I wanted Matt Drake to be a serious character, but as far as being able to plan out each book, I, I, I more work with what happened in the, in the book prior. And then, you know, kind of that, that idea or that thing that just pings you as a writer and says, this is what I've got to write next. Got it. So did you, once you've got the, uh, the two book deal, did you go mm -hmm. back and make changes that would lend themselves to, uh, to better have that story move in to this next one? So that would have been the smart thing to do, Jack. The, uh, <laughs> no, no, I did not do that. I had the first book down already and I had kind of, my, my agent is fab, fabulous. It's Barbara Powell. And she, she pushed me really hard. As soon as we um, got the book to where it was ready to, to go out to editors, she's like, you need to already be thinking about the next book. You need to think about what you're going to do because that'll be part of your editorial conversation with, with your editor when you do that. And, and it was a little bit, but it was also, I think, what she was helping me with. And, and you obviously experienced this firsthand too, is that, you know, when you have your, your entire life to write that first book that doesn't, that, that sells or doesn't sell and then bam, it happens. And then you have suddenly you're on a deadline for the first time and you have 12 months to crank that book out. And so what she was trying to help me with there a little bit is, come on, Bentley, get, get rolling on that next book, figure it out what it's going to be. And so I didn't make any changes to kind of lend it to it, but I did start to figure out which characters I thought I were going to carry forward and, and what that second book was going to look like. Nice. So, so, so in that, uh, in that same vein there, um, what was different like mindset wise? So you finished that first one, you get it out there, you yep. know, it's going to be, be published. Now you've moved on to the, the yep. outside man. Uh, so what was different from, uh, from a mindset perspective as you start down that path? Yeah. And so it's kind of crazy because when you're, again, for me, I wrote three books that didn't go anywhere. So when I'm writing, you know, without sanction, I'm like, yeah, maybe somebody will read it. Maybe somebody won't. And then it sells and you're writing the book that you know somebody's going to read. And it's, and it's a completely different um, experience because there are – I'm also the crazy guy. I love how you do it where you go and get your reviews, your worst reviews, and read them online, which I think is hysterical. But I take screenshots of them and I carry them around and I show my wife. I'm like, look how much this guy hates me. Like he went to all this length to tell me how much he hates me. Yeah. But, you know, all kidding aside, I read some of those reviews too. And, and you try and figure out what people like, what people don't like. And some of that is probably good. And some of it is probably it gets in your way as you're writing the second book. Right. And so there was a part where I had to just stop and say, OK, I got to put all of that out of my mind. I got to put out of my mind the fact that folks are actually going to read this book and go back kind of to your first love as it, as it were with that writing and say, I just need to focus on writing the best book that I can that carries on this next one and not worry about those things. And I think at least from my experience, that's a little easier said than done. I mean, how, how did you deal with that going from one book to, to two books, to three books? 
Yeah, so I always knew that I was going to write at least two. And if both of them didn't go anywhere, then I was going to reevaluate my life's choices. But uh, with John Grisham <laughs> writing The Time to Kill First and having that, not being yep. able to give that thing away, and then writing The Firm and taking off. So I always knew yep. that I was going to write two. So before I even got it to Emily Bessler, I was already nice. writing that second one. So I was months into the second one. So really, the third one was the only one that I was on gotcha. line for. And I was already in that mindset of, uh, of a series type thing. And I'm always, and I had all these ideas down already. And I, so I kind of knew where it was going. So, um, yes. So, so, it was a, a, so, but, but yeah, so much now you're on deadline and you got to do it. And speaking of being on a deadline, what was different about the writing process? Like for those out there that are writers that are, uh, aspiring yeah. authors, what was different about the writing process from that first one to the second one? What did you shift up as far as mechanics? So I think what was helpful for me is um, my first book. So without sanction, I still had to think a lot about what Matt would do in a situation or how is he, because you're still learning the character, right? As you write them. And certainly, and I imagine with James Reese, it was the same for you. You knew at the core who he was, but you couldn't necessarily that quick say, here's what he'd do in any given situation. The second book was a whole lot easier in that because you spent so much time in that character's mind you start to understand how they think and why and what motivates them on a deeper level. And so that was certainly a whole lot easier. I think the second, the, the other part that again was a mindset switch for me is when, when I had my first editorial call with Tom Colgan for Without Sanction, I felt like I needed to come with all the answers to any of his comments that he had, that it was like a pop quiz or something, right? Like he said, hey, what about this? And I need to just have that answer. And as you know, our relationship, I grew more comfortable with that. It was much um, better the second book around when we'd have that editorial call, because it was much more collaborative. And, and ed, you know, you work with Emily Bessler, who's an incredible editor, too. There's a, you know, they bring a ton, obviously, to this process. And some of it, I think, is us as writers is, you know, being willing enough to invite them into some of it and say, okay, I'm not going to necessarily come with all the answers. Here's what I think, what do you think? And, and it's that, you know, that, uh, you know, relationship that's kind of built on trust at, at some extent where you're going to do your homework, they're going to do your homework. And together, you guys are going to make this a better book than it would be if either one of you were, were kind of alone. And so that was another just big shift for me in the process and, and kind of how it worked. Did you do something? Did you have kind of a similar track as you moved from book, you know, one to two to three to four? Well, I always went in, I always knew I wanted Emily Bessler to be my, my editor. And so I went in there and I said, you know, if she picks this up, if she wants to put exploding robots from outer space in this thing, <laughs> that's what's going in this thing. Uh, so I had that mindset and she didn't though. Her changes have all been so like very minor. Uh, and I thought mm -hmm. that first one, like, oh, she's going to change everything. It's going to, she's yep. going to make it yep. great. Uh, very minor. Like, will you say this here? Would he do this here? And one other thing I don't yep. know. Um, but all yep. of them have been that way thus far anyway. So yeah. We'll see if that changes up with uh, with book five, but uh, it's typically been mechanically. It's been that like one page executive summary, uh, moved into yep. an outline, outline, moved into a book, and all of that. That especially once nice. you change from that outline to the, to the book, things form along the way. Because I find that yep. I get to know the different characters mostly through dialogue, uh, mm -hmm. more interaction mm -hmm. with each other. Uh, that's where I get to yep. really know them as I'm as I'm writing them, and that that getting to know them like that doesn't really come out of the outline or the one page like executive type. Absolutely. Stuff. Absolutely. Uh, do you do the outline? No, I agree do with you. Do you put it all in the big, big outline or do you small outline? No, I, um, I, I write, I write more organically. And so I have an idea of what I want to do. And then I have, um, I was talking with Brad about this last night. I usually have a number of scenes that I know are going to be in the book that are like here, like when I wrote without sanction, I knew that hey ho scene was going to be in there. I knew, you know, kind of where the inflection points are, but the rough draft for me is very um, fluid in that I'm, I'm starting at a place and I kind of know where I'm going, but not exactly all the twists and turns there. And so there's a great book that um, Stephen James, you probably ran into him at Thriller Fest a couple of times too. It's called Story Trump Structure. And so what he talks about is that, you know, at the end of each scene or each chapter, having a series of questions that you ask yourself that are like, how can I raise the stakes further? Um, what can I do here um, to continue to increase the tension? What, what are the you know, questions that I asked in the first chapter or the preceding chapter that haven't been answered yet? And I kind of use that to shape where I'm going. And then once I have that rough draft, I really love the book, Save the Cat, which is 
um, a book about writing screenplays, but it, it breaks down and says, hey, in any three act screenplay, here are the beats that need to be there in act one in act two, act three. And so once I've got that, that first draft done, I take note cards and note card out all the scenes. And then I have the beats from Save the Cat and I kind of lay those on top of it and say, okay, here's, you know, the inciting event didn't happen soon enough. Or I think this is also, you know, the all is lost moment, but it's, it's not sharp enough or my, and that's where I start to get much more analytical. And, and that's where the, I think the story itself gets sharper and more focused is when I go from the first draft to the second or third. So interesting. That's almost opposite uh, that we do almost the opposite thing. Cause I write it out, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not like a Kyle Mills outline. Like he's describing yeah, 42,000 words <laughs> and some hands in there and you're good after that thing. Um, but uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it, it provides that path. It provides that beginning, middle, yep. end. I know where I'm going. Yep. Uh, I know what I want to, do to get there and then I kind of fill in along the way but um but that's but then the art kind of that, that's like the the mechanics piece and then the the art piece is is doing the rest of it but I never go back and down I'm not to yep. read those books I wrote them down I wrote them down <laughs> but, uh, I think so, you're doing all right so oh, I'm thank not you. saying thank you have to read these books <laughs> well, yes, that, can, I, can I interrupt for a minute yeah, yeah. Thomas? I completely yes. forgot after we talked about it before we started to ask each of you to hold up a copy of the outside so I could do right here it is. So in transit to the poison pan as we speak um, are John's autographed copies of The Outside Man, which we sent to him and which we'll be delivering. And um, Don was with us for Without Sanction last year. Many of you bought it, yep. so you will want an autographed copy of The Outside Man. And when we get around to Jack, Jack, I'm happy to say, is willing to unpack and repack endless curtains um of the devil's hand or, no it's devil's hand isn't it without the devil's oh it hand. does have a the you just had your, the. Yep, you just had your hand or, right okay <laughs> the devil's hand which is the fourth famous Reese book but i have a question to ask both of you you've been talking about pace and, and other things but it seems to me and this is not true just of thrillers but um of any story is that you really have to have an end that is as good as the beginning and must deliver on the beginning. I mean, middles can sag some, but it's so much easier to think up a great inciting incident Absolutely. and hard to bring it to a conclusion. But if you if you flunk that, it's a really disappointing yep. journey for the reader. So why don't you each talk a bit about how you how you do that? You've talked about your process with Save the Cat and all, but how does that get you sure. to the really great ending? No, that that's a great point. And it's, you know, so many... Uh, one of my friends, um, his wife is a huge reader, and and he said when he gave her my book without sanction, he said she liked it all the way, um, but he said I knew it, whether it would be a good book or not is if she liked the ending, because so many books she feels like don't do a good enough job tying that off, and I feel like almost like in musical terms, there's this thing that's, that's, that's called resolving the chord, right? So when, when you're mu moving through a musical piece and you do a final kind of upswing and, and the audience is waiting for that last part for the chord to come back down and resolve. And, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to, unless you're a music theory person, and I'm doing a terrible job probably describing it, to say why it wasn't satisfying, but you know that something is missing until that happens. And so I think the, the part, to, to your point, anybody can write maybe the beginning of a story, right? It's, it's super easy to come up with that inciting incident or, you know, right then you feel like there's rocket fuel. But the real art of it, to, I think, to your point, is how you finish that story. Do you resolve the chord or not? And I spend a lot of time thinking about that through the entire process, even as I'm writing organically, is, is I'll probably have four or five different endings in mine and sometimes you know for the the Tom Clancy book I just turned in Target Acquired I rewrote the ending three different times for it because each time I'm like ah it's not quite right I didn't resolve the chord yet there's something that's hanging there and even you know Tom uh, my editor came back and he's like do this one more thing and it's like then I could hear that whoa that's the chord it's resolved now and so I think you're absolutely right and and I spend a ton of time trying to figure that out yeah, so it's it's similar in that in that uh, I want to give enough resolution to the reader where they where they feel like oh they, they feel that that sense that they they have that resolution they've been looking for this entire time but also just leave a little bit more out there that makes them want to get the next book and I try to do that mm -hmm. at the end of every chapter 
as well. Okay, we got Absolutely. to this point here. I want them to turn that page and keep writing and stay up another another hour and and and, and keep reading this thing through the night. So uh, what I try to do with each chapter, I also try to do at the end, but in a way that brings that that brings the story resolution, but then also leaves that little bit out there for people to want to read that next book. So that's uh, and then mm -hmm. I've had the end in mind for each one of the books so far to include the fifth one that I'm writing now. So I know nice. what's going. I know how they're gonna gonna end and how it's gonna lead into that next book. So uh, yeah, I mean, I readers, have that before I start. Readers really complain if they are left on too big a cliffhanger. You yep. do one, and mm -hmm. I think on your musical analogy is great, and and you're making me think of something. I mean, it is about you know the chord and getting back to mm -hmm. harmony. But I've spent yeah. much of my life in opera houses. And operas mm -hmm. have ridiculous plots much of the time, as you well know. I mean, some of them are just so bad, they'd never be published in fiction. <laughs> but I've always remembered, I mean, because most of the time when the music comes to a halt, you know, if it's great, the audience leaps to its feet and, you know, mm -hmm. loud cries and much applause and flowers and, you know, the whole yep, nine yep, yep. But I went to a performance in Santa Fe that had an ending that was so magical. It's an open air opera house and, and you know, mm -hmm. you can see the night sky and the whole bit. And at the very end, because it's a Greek myth, the um, one of the stars takes the other singer who turns into Ursa Minor, the bear, it's a Greek myth. And she goes like this and throws her up into the sky and there's an elevator that she lands oh, on the wow. wishes. And I'm telling you, there was five minutes of silence when the opera ended, people were so absolutely yep. knocked out yep. by this ending that that they were almost paralyzed. And I thought yeah. that was the most spectacular tribute that I have ever seen. You know, not wild applause and flowers and all, but five minutes of silence. And some people were crying, and it was amazing. Yep. Yep. And uh, so that, you know, that was partly the production. But how wonderful if you can bring your readers to the point where they are not necessarily applauding, but just sort of gasping in their chair and saying, oh my God. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I think some of the the best book endings is when you finish reading it and then you take the book and you set it down and you're like, I gotta think about that for a minute. Like that, that just because even though the story's ended, you're still to your point, you know, sitting there in silence, you know, like that moved me at it's such a primal level that I have to sit and process what I just read and finished. And, you know, there are probably very few that can do that, but I think that's what you're looking for at the end, right? It's not just the Jack's point. You certainly want the, the reader to go forward and want to grab the next book, but man, if you can make them set that book down and then sit and think about it for a minute afterwards, I think you rocked it. Yeah. And reading it again, the, the ones that I want to read, I get to the end and just put it down or the ones I get to the end and I'm like, oh, I want to go read that last half a page or that last full page or that mm -hmm. last paragraph, that last sentence one more time, yeah. two more times, three more times. Uh, so and I've done that my my whole life. So um, yeah, no, that's that's amazing. I love the ending. I love working on the endings and coming up with those the endings and kind of with the titles. I love, I love the whole process. But uh, <laughs> uh, well, one thing I did want to tell you uh, that I, the seal hair gel comment did not go unnoticed. <laughs> I think it was chapter 37 or so. Uh, <laughs> not that I, yeah. So cut I love a little it. No, too fantastic. close to the bone there, didn't it? <laughs> it? It cut a little too close to the bone. It, it's funny. The um, I can't remember if I used it in this one or one of the Clancy ones, but one of the guys I, again, like I said, I, I've just been fortunate to make really interesting friends, and there were a couple of folks who were green berets and they would kid one guy all the time because he was so well dressed and had such good hair and he's like he's really a seal he's here he's a green beret but in his heart he's a seal he dresses like a seal i'm like i gotta use that i gotta use that for jack That's fantastic. i love it it stood out to me uh you know, what, what do you think uh, do you draw on more or have you drawn on thus far for these two books, not the Tom Clancy ones. I want to ask you about that in a minute. But uh, sure. is it the military experience or the FBI experience, either in creating characters or in the plot, plot lines? Yep. So for Matt and what he does, I use more of the FBI experience and some of the folks that I've rubbed shoulders with there. And, and again, when I was an FBI agent, I was a human guy, which means that my job was to run and recruit sources. And so you you do that. I kind of took that and, and brought it over to Matt and and had it um, be his job, except for he's a lot more interesting than I am, hopefully. And and so I draw on a lot when we're talking about, you know, pitching assets or working that or psychological thing. I certainly draw a lot of on that when it's more of the the cool kinetic things and everything. That's certainly 
the interesting friends I've made in my in my background. So you're I know you're a sniper. I have a, a very good friend named Jason Beefley, who's a retired retired sergeant major that spent a long, long time in Delta Force. And so he's kind of my go to guy for a lot of that stuff. So in the outside man, there's a section that isn't distance shooting, but it's kind of precision shooting, I guess, if you will. And he's the one that will read that and vet it and say, yep, yep, here. And, he, and he's given me, which I think you, folks like you and Brad come by naturally, is that little bit of veracity to ground the scene, right? Because you're, and Barbara, I think you asked me about this last time, which is still a really good question about how much detail you add in versus how much you want to keep just the scene moving. And so I'm, I'm looking for that one thing that maybe somebody like you would read or somebody's like, yeah, this kind of rings true where I can put that much in, but not give them a class or write a technical manual as I'm doing it. And so he's really, really good for that. He's the one that ha helped me out with the hey-ho scene and stuff like that too. But oftentimes he'll read it and I'll never let him just respond via email. I'm like, get on the phone. We're going to talk about it. So I can hear his voice and what parts he likes. And he'll go through and say this, this, you might want to change this and maybe this. And I say, yeah, but that part, did you like it? And he's like, yeah, it was a great story. We just wouldn't do that. I'm like, I'm keeping it in because, you know, at the end of the day, for me personally, other than books, the things I'm a kid of the eighties and, and the nineties somewhat, but more the eighties. And the thing that influenced me even more so than books were the movies of those time, like movies like Lethal Weapon or Die Hard or, you know, bad. I noticed a couple stuff. lines in here. Yes, yes, there are <laughs> some in there from that. And if you look at it, you know, when people ask you, ask me, how much reality do you want in there? Or what well, I said, you know, if you look at the movie Die Hard, there are certainly portions of it where, you know, he straps some C4 to a chair and drops it down an elevator shaft and takes out the whole floor. And it's not uber realistic at that point. But you can believe that what he's going through is real, that the internal struggles are real, that he's really in, in danger, that those things are real. And the rest of it is entertainment and, and viewers go along with that. And so that's kind of the balance I try and strike in my books is that I know, and, and obviously, you know, from actually doing this for real, there are things that happen or things that can't happen that would never happen in real life, but it makes a great story. And so if you're able to walk that line where readers are saying, hey, I'm going to suspend my disbelief and go with you, and you're going to drop enough nuggets in there that ground me that I believe, yep, you know what you're talking about, or you're, you're bringing me into the scene, or here's this little bit of truth, then I'll go with you for it. And that's kind of where, where I try and do it. I mean, how, how do you, do you feel sometimes is your background an impediment because you know so much of how it actually happens that you have to dial it back? so that it it flows as a story or be realistic or how do you handle that balance i try to keep it as realistic as i can but more so from the uh emotions and feelings perspective yeah. the other stuff just yeah, comes yeah, naturally yeah. It'd be hard for me to write something that wasn't realistic as far as a firearm goes like i'd have to work at that yep. part so the, the yep. so that part comes naturally so uh well so does the feelings and emotions uh in there but that's more what i'm what i'm thinking about what would you be feeling here how what would you be uh, what would you be thinking about would that emotion be yep. uh, how would you feel afterward like so that's more what I what yep. I think in those scenes because the other part you know the how how things work or how you're you know doing this or that um, yeah but as I as I go along this path I'm a, I'll double check that stuff a little more because uh, <laughs> four years I put between me and actually jumping out of a plane I got to double check that stuff just to make sure uh, but I like to keep it keep it pretty realistic in there and then uh, I, I want to ask you about bad guys so the devil I want you to ask yeah. you about where you get uh, your inspiration for the bad guys do they come from a, a conglomeration of, of real life bad guys or intel packets yeah. that you read over the years or from uh from from other uh character yeah. movies or what, where does that where does that come from where did the devil so the devil from? yeah no that's a great question so the devil in particular when when i was working on without sanction and somewhat the outside man i remember i like all of us probably that read and, read or write in this genre do watching the rise and fall of isis right and being fascinated at what was happening across iraq and syria and what was always really interesting to me is that as folks started pulling back the onion there you could see that a lot of the leadership in isis were not necessarily um religious fanatics like you'd think they were former saddam Hussein, very high ranking generals and stuff like that, that go figure when the Iraqi army gets disbanded and they have nothing else to do, they're not just going to sit at home and collect their retirement check, right? They're going to go out and find something else to do. And so 
when I saw that, and then I started thinking, well, I wonder what else possible generals who used to be in Saddam's army would do. You know, if you're in that, in that chaotic environment that is ripe for, you know, a very strong leader to come back and assert themselves, who could come out of that? And, and so that was kind of where the devil was born. And then I think, you know, the key to this, to the, any genre, but I, I think especially in this, in this um, thriller, espionage, military thriller genre, where you're writing these larger than life protagonists is for them to be effective, there has to be a bad guy that's their equal or even better, right? That's, that's one step ahead of him, that knows things that they don't, that, because otherwise it gets to be, the reader, I think, subconsciously looks and says, you know, you kind of have Superman syndrome now, where your protagonist is always ahead of them, is always invulnerable. And so you could be writing the best gunfight scene in the world, but if the reader doesn't believe the protagonist actually has something at stake, then you lose that tension, right? And I think one of the ways that you do that very well is having these larger than life villains that are ahead of your protagonist, that your protagonist has to somehow stand up and match match up to and, and be able to go toe to toe with. And so that's where the devil came from. Nice. I love it. I love it. And I don't know how much time we have. So I want to get some of these last questions in before we go to some questions from from Facebook. Um, but I want to jump ahead to Tom Clancy. So that is mm -hmm. uh, is coming out on June 8th. And yep. uh, so you're taking over the Jack Ryan Jr. series with Target yep. Acquire. And congratulations. Yep. That is that is awesome. Uh, Very thank cool, you. by the way. So uh, first, how much overlap was there between these two books? Did you finish The Outside Man first and then Target Acquired, or was there a little bit of overlap there, or was there an editing, writing, or how did that work? So this is how it worked, is that the Tom Colgan, who is, who is my editor, um, he is a fantastic guy, but he's a wily guy, and he's, and he's got a plan, and he's, he's kind of the man behind the curtain that's moving things around. And so we are having our call, editorial call for The Outside Man, and he totally does the Colombo thing. Like we go through the entire thing and the last thing he's like, one more thing. How'd you feel about writing the Tom Clancy Jack Ryan Jr. series? And I'm like, what did you just say? Like, <laughs> what are the words that just came out of your mouth? And so he, you know, there's, I went back and, and talked to my wife and family about it. And, and we said, yes, but there was a, a period of time where we were still trying to work out the details from that. And my next Matt book, I thought was going to still be due in December, like the previous one. And so I'm writing Matt, I'm writing Matt, I'm writing Matt, I'm writing Matt. And then we get the details worked out and Tom comes up and he's like, hey, this is what we're actually gonna do. We're going to, so going forward, the Tom Clancy book will come out and then your Matt book will come out after. So I really don't need the Matt book in, in December. I can, you can have six more months, but I need the Clancy book in February. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's no problem. So I'm like, stop writing all the Matt stuff, set it aside jump in the Clancy stuff, start writing that full, full, full bore. And, and luckily, you know, the guys that have written that before. So Mike Madden, I know is the Barbara's a huge fan of Mike Madden. He's a fantastic writer. Mark Graney is a fantastic writer, Mark Cameron. And so I called up my friend, Mark Graney, who again, Tom set up and Tom said, you can talk to Mark Graney and Mark Graney deservedly fantastic writer, the nicest guy in publishing, but he tried to be mean with me on this call. He tried, he started and he's like, I'm not going to tell you to write this because it's a lot of work. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the good, the bad and the ugly. And at the end, he's like, you got to write this book. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You got to do it. And so I said, okay, but can you send me a Bible or something? Right. Can you send me something that can help me? And he's like, yeah, I got something. And so he sends me this. So this is Mark Graney's Bible for the Tom Clancy one. And it's little Mark Grady post-it notes that are all over this book where you got to say, hey, what's the campus? And you turn to this page. And I was extremely grateful for this because he didn't have to do it. And then when you and I are talking with freaking <laughs> Grady last time with Barbara, we find out that he actually made a Bible for Mark Cameron and gave it to him. And he gave me this. He only this made one copy. Right here. He only made yes. one copy. He one typed copy. it out on a typewriter. That's it. It, was it. it was only one. I could tell that it really guy. annoyed you <laughs> to discover that. Now, I, have, I haven't actually yet heard officially from your publisher, but I'm going to assume that we're going to be talking to you about Target Acquired, the Tom Clancy Absolutely. book, um, in June. So stay tuned for any of you who are interested in that. We'll, I'm sure, 
get to announce the date before long. So Jack, tell us about your book. I'm excited. All right. Yeah. So we have The Devil's Hand, which is coming out here at April 13th. So it's coming up quick. These are the galley copies right here. So it's a little, you know, rough draft essentially still, but uh, coming out soon. And once again, it's one of those ones that uh, uh, I wanted to dive into a subject, to a theme. And this one explored what the enemy has learned from us in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, other flashpoints around the world after watching us at war really for the last 20 years and what lessons have they taken and incorporated into their battle plans and also what did they take from 1979 up to 2001 and how did they have they incorporated all those lessons in there and then what did they learn from covid what did they learn from seeing us in this country with riots over the summer from what seems to be from the outside irre irreconcilable political differences and they're not just looking at those things and letting them pass saying oh that's interesting no they're they're internalizing those things and they're applying them to future battle plans, just like we do with other countries around the world. So I thought, what if I'm Iran? What if I'm Russia? What if I'm China? What if I'm North Korea? What if I'm a terrorist organization? What if I'm a super empowered individual? What lessons would I take and then apply to my battle plan? So it's that. And then it also explores the legality, ethics, morality behind targeted assassinations, um, what Israel does uh, quite frequently, what we do as well, not quite as frequently. But um, so I wanted to explore those two things. And that really forms the basis for the devil's hand. Sounds so can I ask a question? Can I ask a question about that real quick? Because you so in Savage Son, fantastic book. And this was, I think you even said kind of your homage to the most dangerous game, right? Like this thing that every thriller writer ever has read and loved. So how do you what you what you described just now was like a whole bunch of research and a whole bunch of very high level. So how do you go from that to a story? Like what's the next step in your process? Because with the most dangerous game, I think it was maybe not certainly not easier but more obvious because there was already a story that laid out and you were writing kind of your your homage to that how were you doing it with devil's hand yeah like a good way to do it is to take a picture and i had four books i mean it's really what i've read my whole life but uh mm -hmm. four specific books that uh and they're all in the back in the acknowledgments of savage son uh but in the devil's hand the stack of books for research is like this I'll post a picture of it in early April. It, it, there are a lot of books. There's probably 15 or 20 books. Uh, and luckily, this story was research intensive and not necessarily boots on the ground intensive because with COVID mm -hmm. uh, this last year, especially when I started yep. writing it, yep. uh, I couldn't just fly around the world to different places uh, like I did. I went to Russia, Kamchatka, Russia for Savage Sun. I was in Mozambique and South Africa nice. for for uh, uh, for uh, True Believer. And so I'd, I'd been to Iraq and Afghanistan for the first book, that sort of thing. So um, for, for this one, research intensive, US based. So that was, that was I was very fortunate uh, that that was the case because I like to go these to these places to get that boots yep. on the ground, local flavor and incorporate it into the, into the storyline. Um, so this one, I knew what I wanted to explore. And then I started doing that research. So I started reading all about cool. uh, chemical and biological weapons, really going into uh, what led up to 1979 in Iran, uh, what mm -hmm. happened throughout the 80s terrorism. Like I knew it from growing up and from studying it my whole life, but now yeah. I need to figure out how I'm gonna apply that history to a fictional narrative. So then the research began in very intense. And then as I'm doing that research, I get other ideas. And at the same time, cool. COVID's developing at the same time. And then we hit the end of May and then we have these riots and then we have an election. So as I'm writing, things are changing real time that the enemy is taking note of. Uh, and so yep. I'm incorporating those in as well. So it's, uh, yeah, so it, was a, it was a very dynamic process. And then we moved of course, in the middle of it. And the kids are home from school. And so, and they're in the house. And so it's, it was chaos, but uh, yeah, no, it was, it was fantastic. I loved every part of it. And now I'm, I'm just super excited to keep going on book five. That's well, awesome. we're excited too. I'm going to call him Patrick Bank, but I'm going to make a confession while he comes out of his dark hole, which is mm -hmm. I was not a Tom Clancy reader. They were too technical for me. And I, you know, I tried. And I mean, mm -hmm. I know the hunt for Red October is brilliant and all the rest of it. Never can warm up to it, but you guys, and we've been talking about it this entire conversation, are really character driven as much as action mm -hmm. and weaponry and all the rest of it. And yeah. um, I don't appear to be an obvious fancy reader, but I love these characters. And, you know, yeah. if my eyes glaze over over some of the technical stuff, that's okay, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and I have to say this to make you feel better, Don, is Jack just held up his beautiful bound copy of The Devil's Hand. I am looking across the room at a manuscript like this that I was forced to print out. Of so, oh, this? 
Yes, because I don't have one of those. I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> no, it's okay, because actually what I do with manuscripts is, you know, I read them and I throw the pages away as I go. But the problem is <laughs> that when we come back to talk, I don't, I don't have one in front of me. And usually the books haven't yet gotten here because they're with you somewhere, which leaves me at a disadvantage. So we'll see. I'm sending, I mean, it, sending it to you tomorrow. Uh, uh, but I hate giving these out. They're, they're rough drafts still. There's still mistakes in here. So for me, it's so oh, hard. No. To, like, it's still out that has has errors in it still so a galley copy is not the final right. i will gloss i will gloss right over the errors i i read so fast i don't even see her so right. just deal. Not, deal. right so patrick you've joined us dear thank you i yeah. um, got questions or comments we do yeah um let's see i think this question is for both of you guys uh gary asks how do you go about choosing your characters uh choices of weapons are they typically your own personal favorites? So let me uh, answer first, because Jack is going to make me look silly. So I am not a weapons guy or a gear guy or anything. So most of the time, what Matt uses is what I used. And so he uses a Glock because I use a Glock. He uses an EOTech site because I do. And so I'm very, for the most point, I take the path of least resistance Unless, like I said, there's a there's a scene in The Outside Man where there's some precision shooting. And so I went to my former Delta Force friend and said, what would this guy have? What would this character carry? And that's what I would do. Jack, I'm sure, is going to give a much more entertaining answer than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I use them as character development tools just because I'm... Uh so connected to these different tools, having used them for my whole life, not just in the military, but before, during, and continue to use them, them after. So, um, so depending on who is carrying it, it tells me a lot about them, whether it's a, a leather holster with a, a 1911 carried cocked and locked, or is it, uh, what kind of a knife is that in their pocket? What kind of boots are they wearing? What kind of belt are they wearing? Like all these things tell me a story about that person. So uh, for my main character, James Reese, my protagonist, he typically carries what I'm carrying at the time. So for my first novel, mm -hmm. he's carrying a Glock 19 because that there was no Sig P320 series out there. And I'm going to lose people right now. So I'm going to go, I'll go back <laughs> and, and uh, say that uh, it's, it's evolving. And uh, but all, all four of the novels this year has been used. So this is nice. a tomahawk right there. And uh, that's the one that my protagonist wields in the novels. And it has a just connection, a primal connection to the, the history of, of warfare uh, and warriors. So um, so I do get a, get pretty gear heavy in mine. And I use that all as a, uh, as a character development tool. Did you uh, mention that the flag, the the artwork behind you is actually composed of bullets? That is. So yeah, bullets right there uh, from uh, yeah, Matt Tomlinson in Texas. He makes, does art with uh, with bullets. So uh, he sent that out That's a cool. couple months ago. Yeah, crazy. So uh, so yeah, all those things are very uh, near and dear to my heart. And uh, and I use them as such in the, in the stories. So if your beautiful new office caught fire, the bullets wouldn't actually detonate. <laughs> it's just brass. I shouldn't say bullets. It's just brass. So. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's living dangerously. Yeah, they just pop anyway in a fire. But yeah, no, it's, it's just the brass back there. The question, uh, do both of you guys uh, come from military families? Um, I, I do. So my, my grandfather and father both served I, what I like to joke is I'm the first one who served voluntarily. They were, my grandfather was drafted for World War II and my father was for Vietnam. But yeah, and, and my son wants to be against everything I could do a Marine Corps officer. So it looks like it's the family tradition is continuing. Nice. Yeah, my, uh, my grandfather was uh, killed in World War II. He's a Corsair air pilot. Uh, which is a plane that had the gold wow. wings that would fold up like mm -hmm. that. There's a series called Black Sheep Squadron on the, uh, yep. the late 70s. I caught it in syndication in the early 80s. Um, and about is that Robert uh, Conrad? That's it, Robert Conrad. Yes, yeah. it Black was. Squadron, Baba Black Sheep. So uh, such a good show. Yeah, so great. So I think from an early age, all being around his medals and the maps, they silk maps they used to give aviators back then, and his wings and all that sort of thing that really uh, set me on my path. Uh, I never considered doing anything else. Um, and I was going into the military and then all that study and all that reading that I did, that was, uh, that set me on the path to being, being a writer. So from the earliest of days, those were the, the two things I was going to do was serve my country in uniform and then, uh, then write fiction. I have uh, actually a couple of questions for Don about, um, you mentioned that this is, you had several unpublished, uh, mm -hmm. books before, um, people are curious about those. Uh, did Drake feature in either one of those or, um, what can you tell us about them? 
Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the first two, he didn't, the third, he did. And I was still kind of figuring him out. And so the, and again, I, Jack can talk about his writer's experience, but for me, there's a lot of folks think that you can just start off and write a book and that's it. And the hard part is just writing a book. But for me, writing is very much like any other craft, you know, there's an apprenticeship phase, there's a journeyman phase. And then, you know, there's, there's the part where you're ready to go um, actually do it. And so my, you know, folks are, are always like, well, shouldn't, shouldn't you get those novels back out? And I'm like, no, they're exactly where they belong in the bottom of a trunk somewhere, because that was, I didn't know it at the time, but that was very much my journeyman in, in my apprenticeship phase was to, to figure out how to write and to figure out how to write more effectively. And then finally to figure out how to write well enough that a publisher would buy it. And so Matt did, he made an appearance in the third book um, and that's where I first got the idea for the character. But then obviously I, I kind of pulled all that together for the fourth book. Do parts of those books, were you able to sal salvage little bits yeah. or parts of them? Yeah. yeah. Not not necessarily things that happen, but to what Barbara was saying earlier, and and Brad Taylor foot stomps this every time is what is that what people come back for our characters, right? Like I, I'm a huge Daniel Silva fan, and one of my favorite characters, and I don't know if he would even call it a character, is the goat that appears all the time in the Absolutely. island in Corsica. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. the goat. Love the goat, and so there was in in the in my third novel there were a couple of the the character of James and a couple of the other ones I pulled from that novel and brought them in. But I think that's if you can do that and have those compelling characters, that's what people come back for. And Barbara loves the goat too. We're, we're I goat absolutely buddies. do. I love that whole island and that whole yes. you know. Yes. Uh, Daniel wandered off into that, and I wondered where he was going. But then when the goat appeared, I didn't care. Don't <laughs> kill the goat. <laughs> Um, actually, you guys will both like this. This is a good question. Uh, Jack uh, asks, as a child of the 80s, you know that today's movies are missing killer soundtracks. Uh, what song from today will play in the opening credits of the film, The Outside Man? Mm -hmm. that's, a tough Man that's a good question. I don't know if there are any from today that I would use. I use a lot of times, so Matt in Without Sanction, is uses kind of playing guitar in, in the outside man in order to cope with um, some of the PTSD issues he had. And so I'm a horrible guitar player. And when I, I learned my first assignment out of flight school was Korea, and there wasn't a whole lot to do other than fly and, and, and sit in your room. And so there were a number of guys that had guitars and one thought he would teach us all. And he's like, look, you got to have a song, you know, and you got to do simple chord progressions. So we're going to start with the Eagles. And so there were, which seemed very simple until you actually get into it. And so I would have to say it would probably be an Eagle song because I still, somebody asked me today, what's your go-to karaoke song, gun to your head? And I'm like, Tequila Sunrise. And so that, that would probably be, a Tequila Sunrise would be the outside man. I don't know. Save me here, Jack. You got to have something better than that. Well, I, I do. So for the first novel uh, that, that is, uh, I took When the Man Comes Around, Johnny Cash, and I had a part of that song at each part. So I had one right before uh, nice. prologue for part one, part two, part three, epilogue. So I broke it down, a stanza from that song. And then when it got to Simon & Schuster, it made it all the way to, uh, I think it might've made it to the galley. I'm not sure if it made it up to the galley or not, but then it became, oh no, trademark issues with uh, the, the cash <laughs> they just put a song in. Uh, and I was like, oh, why, why not? Um, but I found out that one line from that song he had taken from a song that no one knows who wrote it back in the 1800s. So, uh, so that's what it starts with. So there's only one uh, man going around taking names. So it's, it's, uh, that's the one that'll, that made it. But the song was in my head. I listened to it over and over as I was writing, not during the time I was writing, but you know, I'd listen to it, then I'd write, I'd listen to it in the car. It was just, that was the theme of the terminal list. Um, so nice. yeah, at some point I'd like to go back and like reissue the, the, the novel with those in there with the <laughs> nice. at some point and have that in there as another edition. But, um, and I'm hoping that they do it for the, for the series of the terminal list. Um, I, that was, that was my suggestion. I kept, I keep putting it in there. Uh, I don't know if they keep pulling it out or not. We'll find out, uh, here when it gets to, to editing at some point, but, uh, it's pretty, yeah. pretty spendy to, to put in those kind of things, isn't it? I, I guess that's what they told me, but you know, Hey, it's all relative. Listen, I fell in love with the book. I am in love with a book coming out this month by Sylvain Neuville, who I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but anyway, he's the science fiction fantasy guy, wrote three doorstop books. 
that he's written. Patrick, you'll have to text me because I can't remember the name of it. But in any case, at the, in the end of the book, not only does he have a fabulous afterword in which he talks about such subjects as Russian space dogs, one of whom is still yes. orbiting above us, but he has a complete playlist and every chapter title is a song. Wow. Every chapter has its own song and then he lists them chronologically in the playlist at the back. And I thought, how absolutely cool. But Jack, tell us a moment about, about your movie. Since we're talking about movies briefly here, you are going to be working yeah. on a movie, um, which is why you aren't coming to the Poison Pen, among other reasons, you're going to be instead on set. Yeah, so it's uh, it started last, we started writing the script last January, so just over a year ago. And uh, I'm learning, I'm just soaking it all in, learning how it goes, but uh, started writing it, me and the screenwriter last, uh, last January. And then once that first episode was done, he took it with Chris Pratt and Antoine Fuqua, the director, and they shopped it around and ended up going with Amazon. And now they're starting to film here soon. I think I'm, I don't think I'm allowed to say exactly when, but it's coming, they're starting to film soon and they're starting to release who's part of the cast every, every week here as we, we get going. But it's, uh, I mean, I guess anything can always derail. So I keep my, you know, expectations low, but uh, I mean, they're, Chris is working out, working out hard. He's training. So uh, I <laughs> keep, keep tabs on him, make sure he's in the gym and he's eating right. Um, so yeah, it's, we're starting to take this thing off here soon. And it'll be, uh, once again, once I'm on set, uh, I'll, I'll be soaking it all in and just uh, seeing how it happens. But with COVID, it's really interesting. Like the budget's almost cut in half for COVID protocols. So that's interesting. And then it's in a bubble. So if anybody gets COVID, then, you know, they shut down production and then it, it's everybody's losing it. It's a, it's a big deal. So, um, so this will be a little different than other, uh, productions that have taken place in the past, but, you know, just, just thrilled that it's, uh, thrilled that it's where it is right now. That's so cool, man. That's so cool. It really is. Patrick. There, there have been a few people weighing in that apparently, uh, got the word about some of the casting choices, Jack. I don't know if I can say anything. <laughs> I don't yeah, want to... It's out there. Yeah, it's out there. You could definitely. Chris, Chris Pratt. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Chris um, Brown and Taylor Kitsch is in there and uh, Texas Thompson forever. And, yeah, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. People love that. It's awesome. I love Friday Night Lights. Friday and he's Night who Lights. I wanted. Yep. He's who I wanted. So it was, it's, it was so cool. That's so awesome. For the exact character that he's playing. So I, I can't believe it. So I, yeah, it's just that's great. so awesome. So who would, who would you like Don to play uh, to play Drake? Um, Jack Carr. Jack Carr <laughs> would do a great job of playing Matt Drake. So that's who I'd. Stop it's probably it. Stop just it. The next it's the next step. I'll, I'll just start working out again. Just see it coming. Exactly. I'm a writer now. <laughs> Love it. Anything else, Patrick? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Um, let's see here. I just lost a really good one too. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, we're uh, this is from Lenny, who has a couple of good questions. He says, "Were were either Don or Jack influenced by some of the early '90s military writers like Ralph Peters or Larry Bond?" Absolutely. Like for me, the, so the nineties movie or the, the Tom Clancy was what I say is kind of my gateway drug to that genre. And so you had, you know, Tom Clancy, Larry Bond that wrote um, Red Phoenix, Harold Coyle that had his series of books. There was um, Craig, I forget that wrote Firefox and Jackal No and a bunch of, and so absolutely like all of those were huge influences on me. And that's why it was so cool for me, like Mark Graney's a heck of a guy for a lot of different reasons, but he, in his spare time with Rip Rawlings, just revitalizes that genre with red metal and it goes and hits the New York Times bestseller list. So it was, to me, it was super cool to see somebody take that genre again, that was so big in the eighties and nineties and give it new life. And so I'm super stoked to see what he and Rip do for the sequel to that. Amazing. Yeah, all that. I've been a reader and a writer really since I was a, a little kid. My mom was a librarian, so I was surrounded by books and anything we wanted to read, she supported. So uh, a lot of mine are more more 80s. Uh, that was my kind of formative time. But uh, with David Morrell and Nelson DeMille and AJ Quinnell and JC Pollock and Mark Olden, uh, Tom Clancy, of course, Louis L'Amour. And then we get into Stephen Hunter. I found Stephen Hunter a little later in the 80s, early 90s, went back and read all his early stuff and just, just love him. Everything he's 
doing continues to do today uh then found daniel silva and vince flynn and brad thor mark graney so i've been a, a fan of this this genre for a long time more so the political thriller side i would say but all of these things um influenced me uh not and not just the books but the films and the adaptations from these things yeah. and seeing what to me anyway what what i liked what i didn't what worked and that was giving that was giving myself an early education in the art of storytelling even though i didn't look at it like that at the time and even love- earlier than that, like Jack Higgins, The Eagle Has Landed is one of my favorite books. Barbara, last time you mentioned Ice Station Zero for Alistair M- McClare, right. McLean, Harry yeah. McLean, right? And Where Eagles Dare, a great film with Clint Eastwood and stuff. Like there were so many good folks leading up to that too that, that really set the stage for this genre. They did well. I'm going to give you a Stephen Hunter update. He has a surprise book called Basil's War. Oh. I may you- have to teach him to Zoom. But, um, but it's, you, mean, you mean this one? That very book. Wow. We'll, talk, we'll talk later about it. But yeah. Just arrived today. Just arrived today. And I'm going to email him tonight. I haven't had a chance to even even uh, email him yet or, or text him. But just, yeah, incredible. And then he sent me something very, very special too. But um, yeah, so they're right here on my Is desk. Is that the Maybe. first one that he sent you, the novella that goes with it? No, I have those outside. I have those at uh, out on a stack in the oh, other. Oh, the room. Stephen, the Stephen Hunter novella that precedes Basil's War. Yep. Citadel is absolutely Citadel. my favorite Hunter in lots of respects. So you need to read them both. Yes. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Is Carry on, Patrick. Citadel. Huh? Is that Citadel? Citadel. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely loved Citadel. I just thought it was marvelous. Oh, man, so I yeah. nagged him forever to write Basil's War, and guess what? He did. So cool. That's awesome. So cool. Great writer. Um, Let's see, a friend, I think of probably both of yours, Boyd Morrison uh, is watching and he says, uh, Boyd. he's got a question for you guys. He says, why do you think authors who write about military operators are having such a moment right now? I never thought of it. Those, take that those one, Jack. Yeah, sure. I never thought of it in, uh, in those terms before. So I didn't even realize that we were having a moment. I guess I've been too busy to take a breath and, and look around. I just kind of keep keep reading uh, all the things that I've loved to read my my whole life. So um, if we are having a moment, I'm very, th- I'm thrilled, uh, obviously thrilled with it. But uh, yeah, there's so many choices out there. There's so many great authors, so many great writers out there. Um, and if we are having a moment right now in this, maybe it's because, uh, and if you're asking specifically about authors that have a background doing these things, maybe it's because uh, they're offering an insight into what they've done uh, from having been there, not interviewing someone who has been there, but from actually having been there and then putting it into, to give some perspective on the last 20 years. Like, was it, was anything we did worth it? Uh, was a little bit of it worth it? Why are, did we go there? Why are we still there? Like all those questions that many of us have that spent time down range and lost friends down there. Well, you know, that comes across. It's not like we just compartmentalize that and write a story. Like it's a part of us now. It's and everything yeah. that we write it comes from somewhere. Uh, so maybe that's maybe that's why I mean, we're all looking for a little bit of uh, I don't know clarity and reflection on what we've done the last twenty years. I think that's a great answer. I think the other part of it too is somebody who who isn't from the special operations community is that America watched after September 11th as these 12-man teams, ODA teams, went into Afghanistan and did what everyone thought was impossible. And, and so, you know, we have these pictures of guys riding on horseback with their Afghan partners, calling down artillery strikes and doing what nobody thought was possible. And that only continued, right? That there's, there's such a bigger you know, the, the motto for Army, um, Army Green Berets is, is, or the kind of the unofficial model is the quiet professionals. And, and that was true, I think, for a long, long time and, and still is, I think, from their perspective. But special operations has been thrust into the spotlight because of Afghanistan, because of, you know, what, what Jack and folks like him did in Iraq because of that. And so I think I think uh, the American public wants to know more about that. They've seen it on the news, right? They've seen people doing those things, but I I think they very much want to understand what those people are actually like on a human level. You know, what do they care about? What are they, when they've had folks, um, as Jack said, they've lost comrades. What has that been like? What do they actually do now? And so I think, honestly, I think some of that is, is an appreciation from the American public standpoint that we've heard about these, you know, quote unquote, shadow warriors, and we've seen the incredible things that they've done. What are they really like as people? Like what, what, and I, and I feel like 
books that you write, that Brad Taylor writes, somewhat what I write, that you give them a window on that. And you do it from your own experience. I've done it, done it because I've been fortunate enough to have some of those as friends. But right before this, I was on the phone with a very good friend of mine who was a ranger and who was visiting the grave of a comrade that he lost 20 years ago. It's now been 20 years you know, since we went into Afghanistan. And so those are the things that the rest of us who didn't serve in that community, who don't know someone, don't have a, a vantage point into. And I think the writers that are writing in that genre right now are offering that. Uh, I think in a larger sense too, we're living in a very unstable world. It's full of yeah. threats and we need heroes. We need to feel that there yeah. are some people who can help us navigate, who can save us. I think you can yeah. see that even in, you know, in this prevalence for the Marvel superheroes, even though part of that is driven by computer technology and you know all kinds of fun stuff they can do. But nevertheless, you know, I, think, um, I think we all feel a need for heroes in a very unsettling time. And um, the other thing I find so interesting is that all of you guys have, well, not all of you, but many of these series have special agencies that go with them. You know, we talked about that with Mark um, back on February 15th when, you know, you and Jack and, and some others were part of the conversation. Um, you create a special force that goes with them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's a team. It's not just like Superman out there on yeah. his own, but basically you've got a team that is working to bring some sort of order or make us safe or something. Patrick, yeah. is there anything else? Um, yeah, let's see. George uh, asks, are either of you familiar with Bernard Cornwell, historical writer um, who covers tactics in his fiction? He really no does. And that, oh, if you have never read his Sharp series yeah. all about a Napoleonic War sharpshooter, Jack, oh, um, they right. are Dang. absolutely brilliant. There, I can't remember how many. They would mean more to you, I think, than the Outre, the um, series that he's just finished up with the Saxon. But um, the Sharp books are legendary. They really are. They're fabulous. Yeah, right. And I've Most of it takes out. place in like Spain and Portugal. You know, it's not Waterloo, although eventually you get there. But, you know, it's guerrilla warfare is basically what it is under, you know, fighting Napoleon. I'm going to have to order those from Poison Pen. You can. <laughs> I'm very fond of Bernard, who's, in a, who's a Brit who's lived in the United States now for a very long time. But he is British and, and a brilliant writer. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, you'll really like him. Patrick O'Brien fans usually oh, love yes. Bernard Cornwell. I, I was, that's what I was thinking of when you Yeah, were, it's, a, it's a land-based rather than a sea-based, but it's terrific. Anything else? Just lots of people uh, you know, saying to both of you guys, thank you for your service. Um, you know, a lot of people weighing in about that, about what you were just discussing, you know, about why these kinds of books are, are uh, you know, striking a chord with a lot of people right now. Uh, Gary says... Uh, you're definitely having a moment. I think it's because we are culturally missing true heroism and the power of sacrifice for something greater than ourselves. A lot of people are saying, you know, really nice comments like that. Oh, so, very interesting. Uh, oh, nice. thank you. It, as ever, it's been a tremendous pleasure. So I know I'll get to see yeah. Jack on April 12th. I'm sure I'll see Don second week in June. Uh, don't forget to order a copy of The Outside Man and Autograph Combi. And for God's sake, pre-order The Devil's Hand because we always sell out of Jack's books, even though there are hundreds of them coming and you don't want to be <laughs> left behind. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.